The nervous system is the primary communication and control system of the body, and we can classify its components based on its structural and its functional organization. The central nervous system, often abbreviated as CNS, consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system consists of the cranial nerves, which are nerves that extend from the brain, the spinal nerves, which are nerves that extend from the spinal cord, and the ganglia, which are clusters of neuron cell bodies that are located outside of the CNS. The nervous system can also be classified based on functional organization. It can be divided into the sensory nervous system and the motor nervous system. Let's look at this functional organization in a little more detail. So the sensory nervous system detects stimuli and transmits that information from receptors to the CNS. While the motor nervous system initiates and transmits information from the CNS to the effectors in the peripheral nervous system. Each of those also has two subdivisions. The sensory nervous system can be divided into the somatic sensory and the visceral sensory systems. The somatic sensory system includes sensory input that is consciously perceived by the body. So for example, your eyes are consciously aware of what they see or your ears are constantly aware of what they hear. So the neurons that are involved in those processes are part of the somatic sensory system. The visceral sensory system includes sensory input that is not consciously perceived. So for example, there are neurons in your blood vessels that are able to detect the pressure of those vessels. You don't have any conscious awareness of that input. The motor system can be divided into the somatic motor system and the autonomic so system. And just as with the sensory, the somatic motor nervous system includes output that's conscious or voluntary. You will recall from our discussion of skeletal tissue that skeletal muscle is under voluntary control and is the primary effector of the somatic motor system. The autonomic motor system contains motor output that is involuntarily controlled or that you don't have conscious control over. The main effectors here are going to be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and also some glands. So for example, cardiac muscle is obviously the muscle that tissue that's going to be found in the heart. You can't consciously tell your heart to stop beating. So the neurons going to that cardiac muscle are an example of components of the autonomic motor system. This image is depicting a horizontal section of the spinal cord. Sensory neurons, otherwise known as afferent neurons, carry nerve impulses from sensory receptors to the central nervous system, and these are detecting stimuli or changes in the environment. The cell bodies of sensory neurons are housed in the posterior root ganglia. Recall that a ganglion is a collection of neuron cell bodies that's located outside of the CNS. Motor neurons, or efferent neurons, transmit impulses from the CNS to muscles or glands, and these are known as effectors. The cell bodies of the motor neurons are housed in the ventral horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord. This image also shows you the position of interneurons. Interneurons are entirely within the CNS, and they receive nerve impulses from many other neurons and carry out the integrative functions of the nervous system by facilitating communication between sensory and motor neurons. These interneurons are the most numerous type of neuron. About 90% of our neurons are interneurons, and the more complex the response, the more interneurons are involved. You already know that there are four types of tissue, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. And there are two types of nervous tissue, neurons and glial cells. Neurons are cells that have a very high metabolic rate. They need a continuous supply of oxygen and glucose in order to generate the amount of ATP that they need. They have an extreme longevity. Neurons formed during fetal development still function in elderly adults. So some of the neurons in your body have been there since before you were even born. Neurons are non-mitotic, meaning that they can't divide. Mitotic activity is lost during fetal development, except in certain areas of the brain and with the neurons involved in your sense of smell. That's one of the reasons that brain injuries can be so traumatic because those neurons can't easily be replaced. Neurons are excitable. They respond to a stimulus when they're exposed to either a chemical signal, a stretch, or some type of change in pressure. And they also exhibit conductivity, and this is exhibited when an electrical charge is propagated along the plasma membrane. Glial cells are the second type of nervous tissue, and those are cells that assist the neurons in their functions. We're going to get into glial cells in a little more detail later in this lecture. So what are the various components of a neuron? 
A neuron contains a cell body, and that's the neuron's control center. It has a plasma membrane around it, just like most, just like all animal cells, and it houses the nucleus and most other organelles, such as the mitochondria. The dendrites are shorter processes that extend from the cell body and conduct nervous impulses towards the cell body. The number of dendrites in a neuron varies. Some types of neurons only have a single dendrite, others have many dendrites. The axon is the longer process that's extending from the cell body, and it conducts impulses from the cell body to other neurons, muscle cells, or glands. A few other features that you can see here. The axon hillock is the triangular structure that's located where the axon connects to the cell body. Along the axon here, you can see uh, these little insulating wrappings around the axon, and which collectively form the myelin sheath. And we'll be discussing the production of this sheath in a few minutes. And then at the extreme ends of the axon, we can see small little bulges that are called synaptic knobs. These structures contain neurotransmitters, which are released when an impulse is being transmitted to the next neuron, muscle, or gland. So what about glial cells? I'd like to begin our discussion of glial cells by actually showing you a short little video that I think nicely illustrates and introduces the functions and locations of these glial cells. The type of cells you most likely heard of are the neurons, or nerve cells, which respond to stimuli and transmit signals. These cells get all the publicity. They're the ones we're always thanking every time we ace an exam or think up a snappy comeback to an argument. But these wise guys really account for just a small part of your nervous tissue because they are surrounded and protected by gaggles of neuroglia, or glial cells. Once considered just the scaffolding or glue that held neurons together, we now know that our different glial cell types serve many other important functions, and they make up about half of the mass of your brain, outnumbering their neuron colleagues by about 10 to 1. Star-shaped astrocytes are found in your central nervous system and are your most abundant and versatile glial cells. They anchor neurons to their blood supply and govern the exchange of materials between neurons and capillaries. Also in your central nervous system are your protective microglial cells. They're smaller and kind of thorny looking and act as the main source of immune defense against invading microorganisms in the brain and spinal cord. Your ependymal cells line cavities in your brain and spinal cord and create, secrete, and circulate cerebrospinal fluid that fills those cavities and cushions those organs. And finally, your central nervous system's oligodendrocytes wrap around neurons, producing an insulating barrier called the myelin sheath. Now, over in your peripheral nervous system, there are just two kinds of glial cells. Satellite cells do mainly in the peripheral system what astrocyte cells do in the central system. They surround and support neuron cell bodies, while Schwann cells are similar to your oligodendrocytes in that they wrap around axons and make that insulating myelin sheath. So don't sell your glial cells short. They're in the majority cell-wise, but of course when it comes to passing tests and winning arguments, most of the heavy lifting is done by the neurons. So a quick recap. The central nervous system contains astrocytes, ependymal cells, microglial cells, and oligodendrocytes and the peripheral nervous system contains satellite cells and neurolemocytes. We're going to cover the majority of these in a future module, but today we're going to be introducing oligodendrocytes and neurolemocytes and the role that they have in the production of the myelin sheath. Part of the axon is wrapped in a myelin sheath that's a protective fatty coating that gives it a glossy white appearance. And this helps to support, protect, and insulate an axon. Oligodendrocytes are found in the central nervous system and neurolemocytes, also known as Schwann cells, are found in the peripheral nervous system. Both of these cells wrap themselves around the axons like electrical tape wrapped around a wire and produce myelin, which is an insulator of electrical activity. So what would be the benefit of having this myelin sheath around the neuron? A nerve impulse is essentially a chain in electrical voltage across the membrane of an axon caused by the movement of sodium ions across the membrane. It travels down the axon kind of like a wave. So if this image up at the top here is meant to illustrate a neuron and we've got an, an impulse going across it, that impulse is going to travel as these sodium ions move across. In a myelinated axon, like this image below, there's no change in electrical voltage during the nerve impulse across the membrane in the myelinated portion of the axon, only in the unmyelinated portion. And so this allows an impulse to jump from one neurofibril node, which is the space in between, to the next neurofibril node. And this is referred to as saltatory conduction. 
The result of this is the production of a faster nerve impulse. And that means this also requires less ATP than it does an unmyelinated axon. These are the types of axons that conduct most nerve impulses to skeletal muscles. So as this nerve impulse travels along, we still have the movement of these ions, but we're allowed to jump in these regions that are myelinated. Myelination can be critical to a neuron's proper functioning. I'd like to take a minute to show you a quick video uh, discussing the role that demyelination plays in multiple sclerosis, which I imagine is a disease that you've heard of before. This month, many countries around the world will be spreading awareness on multiple sclerosis, or MS, a disease that affects millions of people worldwide. But what exactly is multiple sclerosis? MS primarily affects the central nervous system, which consists of the brain, spinal cord, and optic nerve. Just about everything you do depends on this system functioning properly, from breathing to moving and even watching YouTube videos. And these actions are all facilitated by neurons throughout your body, cells which we've talked about many times in our previous videos. These neurons are able to send signals all throughout the body at incredible speeds, in part because of the fatty coating that surrounds them, something called myelin or the myelin sheath. This myelin insulates the impulses and allows the nerve signals to reach their destination. However, in the case of MS, this is where the issues occur. The immune system is designed to fight off disease from viruses, bacteria, parasites, or other agents, and does so by distinguishing these things from healthy tissue. But in the case of MS, the immune system ends up attacking the myelin in what is classified as an autoimmune disorder. This process of demyelination can lead to a buildup of scar tissue, hence the word sclerosis. The CNS then becomes unable to send and receive signals properly. Messages traveling along the neurons may be slowed down, distorted, or stopped altogether. Because of the varying locations and nature of demyelination, the symptoms of MS are incredibly diverse. They can range from muscle weakness to decreased coordination, fatigue, vision problems, numbness, or even paralysis. Though, an MRI scan of the brain to look for lesions or scarring is integral to diagnosis. For some, the symptoms come as acute episodes, while others experience more chronic and permanent symptoms which worsen over time. At this point, no true cause or cure is known. While potential links to environmental factors, viral infections, and genetics have been found, studies are ongoing and not yet conclusive. And while there has been a lot of work towards not only alleviating some of the symptoms but slowing their progression, sadly, these treatments do not work for all MS sufferers. Ultimately, bringing light to this issue in an effort to support and fund research is an incredibly important step to erasing MS. And though many of us will never truly understand the challenges of living with MS, we can work together to raise awareness. We would be so grateful if you could take a moment and pass this video on to your family and friends and join in the effort to end MS. So how does myelination occur in the first place? First of all, let's remember that the central nervous system, neurons in the central nervous system, are myelinated by oligodendrocytes. And those oligodendrocytes, a single oligodendrocyte, can actually myelinate multiple axons, as you can see in this illustration. The neural lemmocytes, on the other hand, that are in the peripheral nervous system, will only myelinate a single axon. And you will find multiple neural lemmocytes along a single axon. We're not going to worry about the process of myelination in oligodendrocytes, but I do want to spend a few minutes talking about how the myelination occurs by neurolemocytes. So in this image here, this yellow uh, cylinder is meant to represent a nerve, and then initially this C-shaped cell is the neurolemocyte. So this is kind of a four-step process. Initially, that neurolemocyte is going to start to wrap around the portion of an axon. And as that wrapping continues, the neurolemocyte cytoplasm and the plasma membrane starts forming different layers. So it's kind of wrapping around almost as um, a, you know, a piece of tape would go along um, the spool that it's on. Eventually, these membranes start overlapping, and that starts to begin, and that begins to form the myelin sheath. Notice in these membranes that are closest to the neuron that the cytoplasm has actually been pushed out because they are kind of smashed up against each other, and it's also therefore pushing the nucleus out to the side because the nucleus has to stay in the cytoplasm. Eventually, the cytoplasm and nucleus will be completely squeezed over to the periphery, to the outside edge, and the rest, and that's the only place that you're going to find the cytoplasm. All of the rest of the cell is now just a whole set of uh, concentric rings. Not all neurolemocytes actually myelinate axons.
the last things I want to talk about in this presentation are the layers of connective tissue that surround the parts of the nerve. We've already discussed this concept in talking about skeletal muscles. And so I want you to be able to compare these two because you're going to see that the pattern is very similar. So we're gonna go ahead and draw a circle here. And this circle is going to represent the skeletal muscle as a whole. And we know that within that skeletal muscle, we have multiple fascicles. Within the fascicles, we have multiple fibers. And then within the fibers, we have multiple myofibrils. Do you recall what that layer is, what that outer layer of connective tissue is that's around the skeletal muscle itself? If you remember, that was the epimecium. Epi means above. So that's the epimecium. The, what about the green one? What was the connective tissue that wrapped around the fascicle? The paramecium. And what about the muscle fiber itself? The endomecium. So that represents those three layers. So a, one of them is around circle number one, circle number two, and then circle number three. So now let's compare this type of pattern to that of a nerve, because we can actually use the exact same sketch we just need to change the parts of the word that are here in black. So we're going to leave our endo, our peri, and our epi and look at the structure of a nerve as a whole. So this entire bundle here is the nerve. And again, that's represented by the red circle here. Within the nerve, we also have fascicles. The exact same terminology is used in the muscle. And so our green circle here also represents the fascicle in for applying this diagram to a nerve. Within the fascicles, we don't have muscle fibers, muscle cells, instead in the fascicles of a nerve, we have neurons. So if we look at the sheets that cover those, the sheet that covers the nerve as a whole is the epineurium. So epimecium, because mecium is, is based off of myo, which means muscle, this is the epineurium, referencing the nerve. So if this is the epineurium, what do you think the sheet of connective tissue around the fascicle is called? Hopefully you selected the perineurium. And then the endoneurium is going to be the uh, layer of connective tissue that's, uh, that's actually around and surrounding the entire axon along with the myelin sheath. So again, let's kind of compare those two. We can use a, the exact same drawing. We have our epis that go around the entire muscle, the entire nerve, our peris around the fascicle of the muscle, fascicle of the nerve, and our endos that go around the muscle cell and the nervous cell. Both, of, both the epimecium and the epineurium are composed of dense irregular connective tissue, the paramecium and perineurium dense irregular connective tissue, and the endomecium and endoneurium areolar connective tissue. So this is one of those cases where I would say don't memorize what you don't have to. If you just learn this pattern, then you're going to be able to apply this terminology and the connective tissue pattern to the muscle and the nerve.